So thanks everyone for joining us today. Um, it's brilliant. It's really encouraging to see such a big turnout. Um, it speaks to a real interest and enthusiasm for learning, for sharing insight um, and building awareness of trauma-informed practice and what this means for work with children and young people who are involved in the youth justice system. Um, there are so many of us on the call um, that it won't be possible to do individual introductions, but I can see from the sign-ups that we have a really, really broad range of attendees today, which again is fantastic. Um, and given what we know about the importance of multi-agency working in youth justice and the role that different agencies play um, in providing that trauma-informed care and support to children and young people, it's really good to see this interest and buy-in across such a range of services. Um, so first, some housekeeping. Um, we've got the comments section of the webinar open. If you'd like to share where you've joined us from today, um, kind of the agency or the organisa organisation that you work uh, with, well, you're very welcome to do that. We'd be keen to hear. Um, as we go through the presentation, if you'd like to share any reflections or comments, again, you're very welcome to do so in the comments section. We also will have dedicated time at the end of the webinar to do a Q&A session. Um, and for this, we ask that you use the Q&A function, which is separate to the comments section, uh, to submit any questions or reflections that you would like us to read aloud and respond to and kind of consider together as a research team. Um, please feel free to submit questions to the Q&A function as we go kind of throughout the presentation, whenever they occur to you, and we'll pick these up at the end of the session. So to introduce ourselves and today's webinar, my name is Jess Hull. I'm a Strategy and Insight Manager at Crest, and I'm the Project Manager for the research that we're talking about today. Um, if you haven't heard of us, Crest Advisory is a consultancy um, and the research, and we advise on crime, justice, and public safety. We're really proud as well to have an in-house think tank, Crest Insights, which conducts independent research to drive insight, build evidence, and inform policy um, and reform. We've conducted previous work on youth justice, including around violence and vulnerability, but today in this webinar, we'll be telling you about research that we have just completed, um, generously funded by the Hadley Trust, on how trauma-informed practice is implemented in youth justice from the perspectives of both practitioners and children and young people. Um, before I cover the agenda, I'd really like to introduce you to the members of our team who you can see on the screen, um, some of whom will be presenting to you today as well. Um, so we have Sophie Davis, who is our Director of Research at Crest, and Sophie also runs our think tank Crest Insights. Um, if after the webinar you'd like to get in touch with us about any of this work or any other research or work, please do get in touch with Sophie, she'd be really happy to hear from you. We also have Izzy Ross, who is our lead analyst for this research, and she'll be talking you through our findings from practitioners and from children and young people. We have Anusha Karim as well, who is our analyst and responsible for all our Zoom questions. If you're having any tech difficulty um, or any, any issues with the webinar, do leave a uh, comment in the comments section and Anusha will help you to sort that out. I'm also very pleased to introduce John Poyton, who's joined us today. John is the co-founder and director of the Well Centre and the founder of Red Thread. He contributed the foreword to this research and he'll be leading and facilitating the Q&A session on the research um, at the end of today's webinar. So we've been fairly ambitious with our agenda for today, um, but we've wrapped up intros in good time, which is positive. Um, in a moment, I'll hand over to John, who will share some thoughts on the youth justice landscape, um, the evidence based on trauma-informed work by way of introducing the research and setting the scene for you. After that, I'll give a brief overview of the background and context to our research questions, as well as an overview of our research approach and some of the principles that underpinned this work. I'll then hand over to Izzy, who will talk you through our research findings. So first, she'll take you through um, findings from interviews with practitioners, and then we'll look at some of the findings from interviews with children and young people. And we'll share the recommendations from our research also. Um, after that, we'll do a demonstration of our toolkit resource, which was launched earlier this week. Um, some of you may already have had a look at it. This toolkit is designed to be an engaging and accessible resource to support services who are looking for more information about how to implement a trauma-informed approach at their service. And then, as mentioned, we will wrap up with a Q&A session facilitated by John, and that will take us to 3.30, which is where we will close for today. Um, 
So I will hand over now to John. Thank you, Jess. Um, it's a real pleasure to be here. Uh, it's been a, a real honor to be involved in a very small way um, in some of this research and to have been uh, invited to write the foreword to the report, which I'm sure you've all read. I suppose uh, I'd just love to start. If we're all in a room, it might feel uh, slightly less odd to be doing this than on the webinar, but uh, I'd love you all just to reflect back uh, in your practice, how long is it that you feel you've been engaging with this uh, phrase, with this buzzword, before it became concreted into your practice of trauma-informed practice or trauma-informed approaches? Just in your mind, reflect back and think about how long is it since this approach has shifted and changed the way, the perspective that you see the young people that you work with? I think it's really important to acknowledge the journey that you have all been on uh, over the last number of years and perhaps a decade or so, um, where you and, and certainly all of us who've been involved in this research have recognised the important shift that a trauma-informed lens gives us and the hope and the positive approach it gives us uh, when working in the youth justice system or um, in my experience in the uh, health and youth justice system and across with the, the voluntary sector. So I think we've all been engaging with it for a number of years. I think undoubtedly the reason why there are now, um, well, certainly coming up to 200 of you on the webinar um, is because we recognise the shift it gives us in our perspective, but also the way that it engages with the young people that we're working with. It's transformative and it builds trust. And um, the importance of us working in the ecosystem with our clients, with our young people, is to ensure that when we have an opportunity to build that trust, um, we are then able to scaffold that out to the rest of the professionals in the ecosystem. And that is where I think a trauma-informed lens uh, brings us all together as uh, practitioners and enables the young people to understand uh, that we're all on the same page. Um, so we've seen this huge rise in popularity in trauma-informed practice. I think undoubtedly all of you have felt over the years it has been um, a bit of a buzzword that all of us perhaps had slightly different um, meanings behind the way we use the word. And so that's why I was so delighted to see that Crest were writing uh, this report to really ensure that the, the way that we have been working uh, really starts to build its own evidence base going forward. Because, as I said in the foreword, uh, this is not uh, um, you know, the, the beginning of the end. This is the beginning of the journey for trauma-informed practice, not just in the youth justice system, but across all of the systems and services that young people uh, come into contact with. So I think this is a really timely report, um, particularly whatever our political persuasions, interesting at the beginning of a new government to recognise that we're able to build an evidence base around the practice that you have all been involved in. Uh, and that means that going forward, we'll continue to be able to measure the impact that a, a trauma-informed approach has there's a clear appetite for wider system change in and beyond the youth justice system. So where do we go from here? I'll hand back over the team, but I think it would be really, it's really exciting, A, for us to have uh, this opportunity to engage with the research, to look at the toolkit and to have the Q&A uh, towards the end of this webinar, where we can start to dig in and think about where does the conversation go from here? Um, and, and so I'd love it if you were, would engage both in the chat during this webinar, as well as with the Q&A uh, that we will get to at the end. But also um, there, there are, this is, is in many ways, an invitation to ensure that we continue this conversation outside of the webinar. And we'll be making sure that we point to uh, the places where you can share your best practice and, and where we can ensure that the evidence base beyond this report 
and this toolkit continues to grow and uh, and where we ourselves both online and in real life offline can continue to really engage inspire one another build trust in the system and build trust with our young people and so uh, thank you very much uh, for having me here and i'm looking forward to the webinar along with the rest of you well thank you john um so I'd like to explain to you a little more about how we arrived at our research questions and the rationale for this focus. Um, so as John has referenced there, where we are now in the youth justice landscape, there's an improved understanding of the relationship between violence and trauma. And alongside that, accompanying that, a growing body of evidence suggesting that those who have engaged in offending behavior are more prone to adverse emotional, social, social, sorry, neurological and developmental consequences stemming from that trauma. In response, agencies across the criminal justice system have increasingly adopted trauma-informed practices aimed at raising awareness of the impacts of that trauma, preventing re-traumatization and reducing violence. Um, the picture on serious youth violence is really important context here as well, and was a really valuable and important lens for this research. Um, so we did an initial bit of scoping and looking at national data um, to understand trends. Um, and what that showed us was recent positive trends, including a decrease in the proportion of young people who reoffend and the number of first time entrants to the criminal justice system have shown signs of reverse in the past year. Sig significantly also violence against the person offences represent 19% of offences committed against first-time entrants, and that proportion has been steadily increasing since 2012. Another interesting dimension of this is that the number of re-offences per child has peaked recently in 2022 at four, but the actual proportion of children who re-offend has decreased um, in the last 10 years or so, which might indicate that the youth justice services are managing a smaller but potentially more complex re-offending cohort. The serious violence duty, of course, is also um, an interesting, um, interesting kind of contextual piece here um, with responsibility on authorities to work together to respond to um, serious violence. So thinking in this context and considering this potentially more complex cohort of young people involved in serious violence and with the context of trauma informed practice an increasingly used term across public services, it's really important um, that there's clarity um, and confidence in what those principles actually mean in practice. So that means what should it look like and feel like for practitioners, as well as for children and young people who are supported by youth justice services. Um, and then taking into account the context of serious violence, how is that work applied in support for children and young people who have been involved in serious violence? Um, so our research had three distinct phases of work. Um, in the first phase, we undertook a scoping and mapping exercise. So we reviewed literature on youth justice service performance um, and activity. So that included inspection reports and action plans. And the aim of that was to understand best practice approaches across services in England and Wales. We also held a roundtable discussion with experts in youth justice across policy, academia and practice to explore with them some of the pressing questions and to try and identify where our research could add most value in this space. And this led us to trauma informed practice as a focus. So it was clear that there was significant buy in for the approach, as John's referenced, um, with lots of services making reference to trauma informed practice, talking about trauma informed approaches. Um, but we found there was a, an evidence gap around the application. So what does that actually look like in practice? What does that actually mean? In phase two, we conducted field work with two youth justice services to try to answer this question. So we partnered with Lancashire and Southwark Youth Justice Services to carry out firstly a document review and local data analysis, and then interviews with practitioners across all levels of service, as well as interviews with children and young people supported by both services who had been involved in serious violence. Um, we also engaged with Comtaf Youth Justice Service during this phase of work. Back in May, we published a report um, setting out the findings from that field work. Um, and in a moment, Izzy will take you through those findings from practitioners and young people. We made a series of recommendations as well. And you can find that research published on our website if you'd like to take a look. In phase three, 
we focused on collating and consolidating those findings and examples of best practice. So really aware that where there is good practice, it's critical to share this across services. So services have the tools, they have the opportunity to think about how it might apply to their service um, and, and share that learning. Um, so to do this, we've created a toolkit resource which includes case studies, it includes linked resources, Q&A videos with experts talking about different aspects of embedding trauma-informed work. Um, it's hosted on our website and the toolkit is designed to be an accessible resource for service leads and practitioners who are looking to think about and reflect on how they apply trauma-informed practice in their work. Um, and as mentioned a little later, I'll pull up the toolkit on the screen and show you the different components of that. And then finally, before I hand over to Izzy, I just wanted to spend a moment taking you through some of the key principles underpinning our research approach. Um, so a really important part of the research was our engagement with children and young people. We took a trauma-informed approach in our research as well, um, and in that direct engagement with children and young people in particular, to make sure that they felt comfortable and safe participating in the research. Um, and what this looked like was ensuring that the design of the engagement itself was shaped by young people. So we held a co-design session with young people at Southwark Youth Justice Service, which was supported by YouThink, who I'll talk about a little more later. Um, YouThink are a peer support navigator charity um, who they do work based from Southwark YJS. Um, and in that co-design session, we discussed the best approach to these interviews. So recognizing that an interview with a stranger is uh, most likely quite daunting. It's a bit of an unknown. We offered introductory calls with each young person and their trusted adult before each interview. So an opportunity for the young people to meet us, say hello, ask us any questions about us or about the research and make sure that they felt comfortable and happy with the process. Um, it also meant prioritizing young people's comfort and choice during each interview. So the interviews were held um, at a neutral location to the preference of the young person, whether that was remote or in person. Um, and in each case, they were supported by a trusted adult who they chose. We also explained at the beginning of each interview that the young person could ask us to skip a question or pause or stop the interview at any time. There was no pressure to continue if they didn't want to. They didn't have to give a reason. Um, and then finally, we had different options for how young people could communicate their experience to us. Um, so with paper, pen, sticky notes, if a young person would prefer to draw or write their experience rather than um, tell us verbally. We've set out our approach in, in a bit more detail as well in a blog on the website um, and explored kind of the value and the benefits of taking that approach as well, if you would like to read a bit more about that. Um, and then on the right hand side, just in terms of research design, we've completed this work over a year. So we actually began uh, last July, a year ago now. There have been some delays, some pauses, including because of the local and general election and the pre-election period restrictions. Um, but we're really aware that in that time period, this is a very fast evolving space for practice and for research. Um, in the time that we've undertaken this research over the past year, other significant related, really relevant pieces of research have also been published. It was really important for us to stay aware and alert to this, to emerging insights, new directions, and we're kind of keen to signpost and, and gesture to them in our research also. Um, to support this um, as well, we consulted regularly with a group of experts in youth justice, so some of whom are on the call today. Um, they shared valuable insight from their experience um, across research, across policy work, and also frontline experience. Finally, our approach to the research was very much inductive, so our findings developed on the basis of our observations from the research. We didn't set out with a hypothesis to prove, and this really lent itself well to our research question, so it allowed us to remain curious and exploratory in our approach. So enough from me, I'm now going to hand over to my colleague, Izzy, um, who will take you through the findings from our research. Great, thank you very much, Jess. Um, and hello everyone, it's great to see so many people from so many different agencies represented here. Um, so as Jess said, I'm gonna take you through the research findings and essentially from practitioners, we wanted to find out how practitioners at Youth Justice Services are delivering trauma-informed practice to the children and young people that they're working with. Um, so within that, we were interested in what this felt like from an individual perspective. So that's through direct work with children, as well as at a service level. So that's thinking a bit more broadly about governance, policy, structures. 
We interviewed case managers as well as service leads to understand this. Um, and broadly, we asked about the following questions. So first, how the service developed a trauma-informed approach and how it's embedded. How are practitioners applying trauma-informed practice and what do they understand it to mean? How is it applied for children involved in serious violence? And is there or should there be a difference when applying these approaches to these young people? How do practitioners work with other agencies as part of their trauma-informed approach and what are the barriers of doing so? How do practitioners measure the success of their trauma-informed approach, such as what indicators are captured, how is success recorded, to begin to start to answer the question, how do you know what's working? We wanted to understand as well the similarities and differences between the approaches taken by our two partner services, and we contextualized our findings by conducting a bit of a document review um, and some high-level quantitative analysis of local service data. So notably, the way that practitioners understood and applied trauma-informed practice was really, really consistent across and within services. For almost all practitioners, working in a trauma-informed way was seen as a kind of common sense approach that was aligned to their prior experience and knowledge. Some reflected that trauma-informed practice had given a terminology and a framework to an approach that they'd already been adopting instinctively. Most practitioners describe trauma-informed practice as having an awareness that the lived experience of a young person and their family especially experiences of trauma and adverse childhood experiences, bear a really significant weight on a child's offending behavior. One practitioner encapsulated it really well, I think. Uh, they described it as looking behind the fence. Some practitioners found it difficult to articulate prescriptively exactly how they would be working in a trauma-informed way, but they generally described that taking a relationship-based approach and establishing that trust was critical. For others, embedding the approach was a bit more of an active process of really considering and reconsidering their assumptions about a young person and continually checking whether they've taken into account factors that are relevant from a child's past into the way that they behave. There was a really strong sense from practitioners that trauma-informed practice should follow a child right from their initial assessment up until when they're signposted to other services at the end of their time in the youth justice system. There were some barriers identified by practitioners in their application and understanding of trauma-informed practice. So first, some practitioners experienced issues with their confidence and understanding of a trauma-informed approach. For example, feeling a bit caught up on the word trauma and its meaning, uh, being concerned about re-traumatizing a child or a young person, uh, and also how trauma-informed practice is kind of evolving with developments in research and guidance. There were also some external barriers that we noted. In particular, we heard about families who were quite reluctant to engage with the approach because they might not have felt that it was a harsh enough response for their child's behavior. Um, and we also heard a lot about other agencies who have different levels of understanding of trauma-informed practice, uh, which I'll cover in a bit more detail later. Um, practitioners also face practical issues to do with how conducive their environment is to trauma-informed practice. So practitioners understood that building relationships crucially takes a lot of time and space as a first step before meaningful rehabilitative or reparative work. Uh, so when they had less time, they were able to spend with a child, especially if the child's on a short order. Uh, this was seen as a bit of a barrier for their implementation of trauma-informed practice. Effective multi-agency working is a fundamental pillar of trauma-informed practice, so ensuring children have a continuous and consistent experience with the different agencies they come into contact with. So that's including education, health, police, probation, custody, and more. Um, and under the principles of trauma-informed practice, a child should really be given that same level of support, understanding, and respect at no matter what stage they are on their journey through the youth justice system, and services should be collaborating in order to deliver this consistent support. The practitioners from both services that we spoke to were really keenly aware of this, and there was a strong recognition that cohesion and consistency of approach across agencies was not only essential for an effective trauma-informed approach, but was also a really big opportunity to demonstrate some best practice in trauma-informed working. However, the risks of poor multi-agency working and limited coordination were also uh, raised. So they were seen somewhat to undermine the positive work that a caseworker might have done with a child and risked damaging the trust that had been built up. Practitioners at both services felt that some agencies didn't understand or apply trauma-informed practice in a consistent way, with reference made to education or policing. However, underpinning all of that, there was a recognition that competing organizational priorities and priority outcomes were contributing to this, creating a tension that these agencies are likely finding quite difficult to navigate. One of the key questions for our research was about whether there should be any particular considerations around the application of trauma-informed practice with children and young people who are involved in or at risk of involvement in serious violence. 
This is because we identified, as just mentioned, a bit of an evidence gap there. And this is something that we really wanted to explore with the practitioners that we interviewed. Going into this research, we anticipated that there probably would be some differences. However, instead, we heard back loud and clear uh, that practitioners were clear that trauma-informed practice is as, if not more, imperative for those children involved in serious youth violence. Many really vehemently rejected the idea that they would treat a child any differently or adopt any kind of different strategies or modifications of trauma-informed practice just because the child had been at risk of or involved in serious violence. Um, however, practitioners did identify several external or structural factors that kind of came into play when a child was connected to serious violence um, that had the potential to impact on the effectiveness of trauma-informed practice. One of these challenges was balancing a trauma-informed approach with the need for risk management or mandatory requirements. Additionally, some practitioners acknowledged that children involved in serious violence and working with the service on longer or mandatory sentences were more likely to be involved with other agencies, such as police, probation, youth offending institutes, who might be, in some cases, less attuned to the trauma-informed approach, which could create an inconsistent experience for the child. And relatedly, these children are likely to be experiencing trauma associated with the youth justice system itself. Some practitioners also described a tension in the need to balance consideration for the victim, for public safety, and for the child that they're working with. And finally, on our practitioner findings, most of the practitioners we spoke to were really confident that delivering trauma-informed practice did have a positive impact for the children they were supporting. Many referenced positive changes in how a child was engaging with them during sessions, improved relationship with a child's family and support system, and better behaviors and management of those kind of difficult emotions from the child. However, most practitioners also told us that they felt like they were struggling to capture these softer outcomes in current data systems. For example, where a case manager can see that a young person is better able to cope with difficult feelings and manage their behavior, or where relationships and support systems have improved, but then that young person did go on to re-offend, it's only the latter that's captured and recorded as an outcome, which doesn't really paint the full picture for that child or provide an indicator of the positive impact that trauma-informed practice had had. This really aligned with what we found in our quantitative analysis of service level data, where we found that there was a really limited capability within data capture systems for monitoring the impact of trauma-informed approaches at a service level. Both services recognized that there was a lot more to be done on this and to understand whether and how trauma-informed practice is having an impact and to feed this learning back into, develop, uh, into development, implementation and application going forward, but we'll cover that in a bit more detail after. Um, after we conducted our practitioner interviews, supported by both of our partner services, we arranged eight interviews with children and young people. It was really important to us, as Jess has already spoken about, to do these interviews right. So as previously mentioned, we met with some children and young people at one of our partner services to co-design our engagement plan for the interviews. We asked them questions about the kind of content to cover, whether they'd enjoy using creative components, how to make them feel safe and comfortable, the length of the interview, all the way to what kind of snacks to offer. Um, and also for future research purposes, flat jacks were not as much of a hit as we'd expected. So please keep that in mind. Um, but beyond that, this was a really, really useful exercise for us. And it was pivotal to the participatory approach that we'd been designing. Now, of course, we weren't asking children and young people about trauma-informed practice in the same way that we were asking practitioners. We were interested in how, if at all, they experienced the trauma-informed approach on the ground. And therefore, we decided to approach our interviews in a way where young people would be empowered to assemble their own story. And we'd establish the connections to trauma-informed approach later in our analysis. We explicitly told children at the start that we weren't going to be discussing anything that had happened before their time with the Youth Justice Service. This was to ensure that we wouldn't re-traumatize the child and we weren't going to veer into areas which didn't necessarily relate to our key research questions. Naturally, this choice carried a bit of an inherent limitation, meaning we were less able to answer our key questions on multi-agency working and establish a bit of a comparison between their experience with other services, such as the police or education and the YJS. But we thought that this was an important adjustment to make. In our analysis, we mapped the young people's reflections on their experience at the service, their relationships and activities onto the home office's principles of trauma-informed practice. So we could assess with a bit more uh, robustness in what ways their experiences had and hadn't been trauma-informed. And I'll now provide a bit of an overview of those findings. So the home office trauma-informed principle of trustworthiness involves staff explaining what they're doing and why, doing what they say they're gonna do and not over-promising. Many of the children and young people we spoke to had told us that they'd been really, really nervous coming into the service and that their expectations were quite misaligned with what the YJS actually was. 
Therefore, some young people told us that their caseworker offering them a really clear explanation of the service and their expectations had been very beneficial and effective at calming those nerves. Children and young people also experience trustworthiness and the reliability of their caseworkers or other YJS staff, being able to count on their caseworker to help and support them at regular times, but also in those exceptional circumstances out of work hours. Both of these things were really valuable and important to young people. One young person told us that their caseworker would always reply to their messages if he felt stuck or, or, or overwhelmed and that this had built trust between them. And contrastingly, one child told us that they were quite distressed by the inconsistency of their relationship with one worker at the service who was frequently calling in sick and cancelling sessions. This had clearly broken some trust and jeopardised his sense of routine and security at the service, which he later identified as something that he would prioritise if he was a caseworker. Uh, this first quote on the screen is from this child, and as you can see, he therefore felt that the quote, solution to the problem that got me arrested in the first place was therefore not sufficiently being addressed. Empowerment involves individuals and organizations valuing the feelings and concerns of service users, being attuned to their wants and needs, and supporting them to make changes in their life. Significantly, every single child and young person that we spoke to told us that they felt listened to by their caseworker, and that they believed their caseworker cared about their feelings. The way in which the caseworker talks to them was also really important for young people. Young people describe their caseworkers talking to them not like a child, but in a respectful, honest, and we heard the word chilled quite a lot manner. Several children and young people also shared instances where they connected being listened to by their caseworker with something good happening. Most commonly, that took the form of achieving a personal goal, like getting a job, volunteering, a placement, getting back into studies. They told us that their caseworker had really clearly asked them what their goals were and worked with them extensively to achieve them. And while no young child that we spoke to felt like they hadn't been listened to or had been communicated with poorly, they did say that this kind of set the staff at the YJS aside from other adults in their lives. Cultural consideration involves being aware of cultural stereotypes and actively working to support and empower people with the consideration of their culture in mind. While young people didn't really talk to us directly about instances where they felt culturally understood or appreciated, some did tell us about the value in feeling understood and like they could relate to members of staff. In particular, those children who are part of You Think. Uh, this service was seen as really important to their feeling of being understood by staff, either as a boy or as a person that's been involved in the youth justice service. And this level of understanding didn't necessarily have to come from relating to their caseworker. And in fact, most children and young people we spoke to had a caseworker with a very different background to them, but still felt really understood by them. But it was seen as valuable when their caseworker could work in partnership with other people at the service, for example, connecting them with a man with lived experience of the youth justice system. Safety involves protection from harm and ensuring people feel safe and are not re-traumatized, putting adequate safeguarding measures in place. Um, and this area very much refers to the kind of behind the scenes work of practitioners to ensure that the child that they're working with feels safe. No child or young person explicitly discussed feelings of safety or protection from harm, but it was clear that practitioners had created a really comfortable and non-judgmental space for them at the YJS. One young person mentioned that in their initial sessions with their caseworker, they'd gone and met them in a park in their area as opposed to at the service, which made them feel a lot more comfortable than if they'd gone immediately into the YJS. And this comfort was seen as crucial for the children and young people we spoke to. Um, we asked them a question, which was, if you were a caseworker, how would you like to make the young person you're working with feel? And almost every single child used the word comfortable. This comfortable space at the Youth Justice Service resulted in several children and young people reporting they felt more calm, relaxed, less angry than when they'd started at the service. Some children and young people pointed out that the purpose of their time at the YJS is in part to prevent reoffending, um, and they felt really on track to doing so. Choice refers to giving service users a say in what they do. Almost all children and young people we spoke to said that they felt like they had a choice in what they were doing at the service, specifically regarding the activities they did. Some children and young people referenced that they were aware that they didn't have a choice in attending the service, but within the parameters of that certainty, they liked that they were able to have agency in some parts of their time. A couple of young people also told us that the activities that they'd done with the service were ones that they couldn't have done in their own life, such as getting connected with a placement in a field that they hadn't heard about before. And therefore, in some ways, the Youth Justice Service had expanded their opportunities. Additionally, some young people praised having choice not over what they're doing, but over when or how they're doing it. So one young person told us that they've been able to meet with their caseworker really flexibly around their new job, that they'd gotten through their work with the service. 
another young person had started attending a college that was far away from his home and his bus was frequently delayed. Uh, so his caseworker had subsequently adjusted the time that they met so that he could catch that earlier bus. This was really valuable to both of them. And then contrastingly, one young person felt that they'd scarcely had the opportunity to choose what they wanted to do and that their caseworker was making them meet and speak with a large amount of people, which they in particular didn't enjoy. Another who generally felt like they did have choice in the work that they were doing also could recall to us a negative instance where they didn't, which made them feel frustrated and it really had stuck with them. Collaboration involves utilizing peer support mechanisms and collaboratively considering service users needs. So the value of peer support was epitomized by children and young people's highly favorable reflections on you think a peer support service embedded uh, in Southwark Youth Justice Service. The value that they receive from being mentored by other people with lived experience of the criminal justice system really can't be understated. Again, this didn't, didn't need to come in the form of a caseworker. So children and young people generally describe that workers at the Youth Justice Service were linking in with each other really effectively and were involving re other relevant staff in their journey at the right times. There was a sense from one child that we spoke to that there were a few too many different staff members involved in this journey. And from another that he'd felt upset, for example, when a new clinical practitioner had replaced his old one, as he felt the new one didn't sufficiently understand him and that there'd been some insufficient communication between that original practitioner and their replacement. Some children and young people also referenced that they liked when they didn't have to explain themselves in their story often. So effective information sharing between practitioners is really crucial to maintaining that effective collaboration, both within and outside the service for a child's needs. And finally, we asked children and young people what impacts they felt like their time with the YJS had had on them, as well as what they're most proud of. And we heard six main things come up. The first, regularly attending and attending on time, youth justice service sessions or any other commitments. Several children and young people described this as a change from when they first started with the service. And naturally, this means that services are able to more effectively engage with them. Other children and young people also felt that their relationships with their family members had improved as a result of the work they'd done with the service describing these relationships as less turbulent in general. Some young people felt like they'd matured during their time with the YJS and that they had a stronger sense of self now. Um, and as we increasingly understand the importance of that pro-social identity building, this is obviously quite a significant step. Also significantly, uh, some children and young people believe that they were less angry uh, and they were more able to communicate about their anger and a lot more effectively. Some children and young people have felt like their emotions were in command of them, but they were now able to recognize when they were feeling upset or angry and be able to explain this to a caseworker or a loved one who could in turn support them with these emotions. Many children and young people felt proud that they'd since secured a job or further education, something which had felt quite out of reach for them before their time with the service. And attached to this, some children and young people reflected that they felt like they were looking towards the future more and were setting goals that they hadn't previously done before. Now, naturally, it's impossible to attribute these impacts directly to a trauma-informed approach. However, we know that the staff in the services that they're working with are applying a trauma-informed approach, so we can kind of begin to understand that trauma-informed practice has very likely played a role in these impacts. That brings me to the end of summarizing our key findings, although how long I've talked, I bet that did not feel like a summary, so apologies about that. Um, but hopefully some of them resonated with your own experiences and understanding of working with children and young people, and some of them bring a new perspective on trauma-informed practice to you. And I'll now pass back over to Jess to take us through the recommendations that we've presented in our report. Thank you, Izzy. Um, yeah, as Izzy said, we're particularly keen to hear about how these findings resonate for you. So if there's anything that Izzy's talked through, which you think, yes, actually, um, that feels really familiar to my experience or conversely um, is a bit of a surprise or is kind of you found something different um, in your agency or in your service we'd be really interested to hear that and I think would be um, something interesting to talk through in the Q&A as well so do pop that in a comment. Um, so as Izzy mentioned on the basis of our findings we made a number of recommendations which are targeted at different audiences uh, so we've summarized them on this slide but they're set out more fully in the research report um, so do take a look there as well um, but to summarize for the YJB our recommendations are around updating guidance on trauma-informed practice including on how to understand impact through monitoring um, and continuing to take the lead in capturing and sharing examples of good practice. So, for example, through the resource hub, um, which I'm sure many of you are very familiar with. 
For youth justice services, our recommendations are aimed to support services to reflect how they are embedding trauma-informed practice. So including through a review of their training offer and exploring opportunities for multi-agency working, creating an enabling environment that as you talked about, um, and developing monitoring and evaluation processes around trauma-informed practice. Um, and then importantly as well, thinking about creating mechanisms for young people to help shape and feed into these processes. Finally, we made some recommendations on areas for further research. So these were areas which did um, come up in our work, but which we weren't able to um, properly include in the scope of our research, where we think there's opportunities for further research um, to take place. So that link between the softer outcomes, as you mentioned, so things like better behavior or engagement with their support workers, and desistance. So building on the work by um, YEF, particularly around their outcomes framework, we felt would be um, a helpful place to start. Also looking at how trauma-informed practice is experienced by different groups of young people. Um, so as mentioned, we only were able to speak to eight young people for this research, um, which was certainly valuable, but obviously is not representative of um, all young people's um, experience. And in particular, we weren't able to speak to any girls as part of this research, um, which certainly is a gap and something that we would have would have liked to do and an area where we feel research, future research could focus. So it does the experience um, for different young people around trauma-informed practice differ. Um, what do we need to understand about that? Um, also, on the extent to which interventions aimed at children and young people actually incorporate trauma-informed principles, so looking at interventions specifically, things like mentoring and behavioural programmes, to what extent are those principles embedded in the um, operational working and the delivery of those interventions? And then finally, the application of trauma-informed practice within the youth custodial state. So this is something that came up quite a lot in interviews with practitioners. They would reference that, um, in their view, um, custodial estate was um, sometimes, not all the time, but sometimes where trauma-informed practice um, wasn't as effective, um, wasn't delivered effectively. We didn't speak to anyone from the youth custodial estate, but it's an area where we feel further research would be really valuable to understand what that looks like, what that can look like, and how it's integrated as well with the youth justice landscape more broadly. So, um, as I mentioned at the beginning, the final phase of our research, phase three, involved creating a toolkit as an accessible resource to support services to implement trauma-informed practice by drawing together examples of good practice across services and different aspects of trauma-informed working. The toolkit was developed with input from several experts across frontline policy and research, um, several of whom have contributed to Q&A videos explaining elements of practice, um, but they've also shared resources and case studies, which are included as well. Um, we're very grateful to them for their input and for their time and for helping us to build this resource. So we know that a wealth of information does exist in the trauma-informed practice space, including guidance from YJB and others. But from our fieldwork with partner services, including those interviews with practitioners, there's a suggestion that further support and guidance on how to apply trauma-informed practice across different roles would be very welcome. Um, we also considered the growing body of academic literature on trauma-informed practice in youth justice um, that's begun to consider the role of measuring impact in implementation. Um, but this led us to consider how we can pull all this together in our research. So existing guidance, emerging academic literature into one place that's accessible for practitioners, for services. Um, so we've created this web page, which hopefully acts as a practical resource for agencies considering implementing trauma-informed practice, um, and it shares some of the key lessons that we've learned. So on the screen are some of the different components of the toolkit. Um, so you'll see there's Q&A videos with experts across youth justice. So these are bite-sized captioned videos where our experts respond to questions about their work and share insight um, on key aspects of the implementation of trauma-informed working. So these videos cover, for example, the role of trauma-informed champions, which were used at CUMTAF, um, YJS. Uh, one covers the importance of building pro-social identity and what that looks like, how it's aligned with child first. 
Um, there's one on collaborative working and the work of the Peer Navigator Group You Think as well. There's also one um, on research that's been led by the Race Equality Foundation, building the evidence base on the impact and experience of racial and intergenerational trauma on the lives of children and young people. The toolkit also contains collapsible case studies, which spotlight good practice in local areas. Um, and we also have on there an embedded presentation deck, which provides some guidance on measuring the impact of trauma-informed practice. So as Izzy talked about, this is something that our research found services would really welcome support around. The deck offers guidance on how to monitor and think about evaluating trauma-informed practice, um, including a step-by-step -step of how to develop a theory of change or logic model. And I'll show you that in a moment. Finally, the toolkit signposts onto publications, research and resources that can support you to implement and continue thinking about trauma-informed practice in your service. Um, as John alluded to at the beginning as well, we're really aware that this toolkit represents a snapshot in time. Um, the interest and the research in this area is fast paced, um, which is um, brilliant to see, but we want to ensure that the toolkit remains agile and can direct you on um, to explore other resources and interact with emerging research um, and, and be involved in that conversation. So um, I am now going to bring the toolkit up on the screen. We have some time for me to just walk you through that, show you what it looks like. Um, and we thought it'd be great to show you a couple of the videos in particular. Um, I've done a trial of swapping onto the tab. So let's see if this works. Fingers crossed everyone. Um, there will be an awkward pause while I do that. Okay. I think everyone can see that. Brilliant. So this is what our toolkit page looks like. As you can see, it's housed on the Crest website. Um, so you can access it from there. Um, there's a short introduction to the toolkit, which brings you up to speed on the key findings from the research and links to the report there. Um, the contents page gives you a sense of the different areas that are covered in the toolkit. So you can see there's a piece on first steps, which is making a decision to adopt trauma-informed practice. How do you know if it's right for your service? What are some key things for you to be thinking about um, when thinking about the different ways that you can implement trauma-informed practice? There's a section on measuring impact. So as mentioned, developing a theory of change and monitoring framework. There's a part on developing training and support. Um, then thinking about making changes to practice. There's a section on creating supportive spaces for children and young people. And finally, it considers continuous learning and reflective practice. Um, so I, there isn't time to kind of show you every aspect of this. So really encourage you to, um, to go away and have a look and, and click through some of the um, information on here. I think what I'd like to do is show you a couple of the videos so you have a sense and kind of a flavor of um, what those are like and how they might be useful. Um, so you can think about how you might want to take those away and, and use them as well um, where relevant in your own service and kind of places that you might want to show them to. Um, apologies because they're embedded YouTube videos. So I believe there's probably an ad that's going to show up, but hopefully it's not there for too long. Um, if there are any issues with sound, please do let me know. Okay. In relation to trauma-informed practice, the key thing is about kind of whole system change. So the key thing is about creating the conditions to enable your teams, your practitioners to function in a trauma-informed way. And that means looking at ourselves first. Um, it means looking at the, um, the functions of the team, how the team is with each other, how we support each other to reflect upon self in our practice and reflect upon our own lived experiences and our own bias um, as a starting point. So that, that that would be my starting point, followed by workforce development approaches and then thinking about what learn and sustain looks like, particularly around practice integration. 
from a youth justice perspective, the, the key thing is it starts to shift how we think about children, how we take those principles of child first practice, seeing children as children, building pro-social identity for children, collaborating with children and diverting children from stigma. It starts to help us shift away from looking at kind of what's wrong with the child, their behaviour, to what's happened to the child for them to end up in the position they're in. And that helps us to then move our practice away from deficit focused models, models focused on um, the behaviour itself, to models that are much more focused on repairing attachment through relationships and building pro social identity for children. One of the central tenets or the contemporary evidence base of moving children away from offending behaviour is collaborating with children. We see co-production and participation as an intervention in its own right. We, we, we want to take the ideas of co-production beyond a nice to have helping us shape and inform services to actually seeing that as an opportunity for children to feel a sense of worth and value to see that as an opportunity for children to move on in their lives and, and recover from trauma as a result of being connected and part of something that's bigger than themselves on their own. So really showing their true worth and value is, is a really key intervention for us. Brilliant. And that was Michael O'Connor, who's the head of North Somerset Youth Justice Services. Um, and he was talking there about how organisations can effectively implement a trauma informed approach in their work and how that change can impact practice and the importance of co-production. Um, so the next section, which I'd like to show you, is on measuring impact. Um, so what we have done is skip back to the beginning. Um, we have created a, apologies. Uh, we've created a slide deck, which I'm spoiling by skipping through all the slides, we in reverse, um, but let's pretend that you didn't see that. And um, we've created an embedded slide deck, um, which sits on the toolkit page, which is about measuring the impact of trauma-informed practice in youth justice. Um, and as, um, Izzy mentioned, this is in response to um, feedback from practitioners that they could anecdotally see the impact that trauma-informed practice was having for the young people and children that they worked with and supported. But when we asked kind of how is that, how is that captured? How does the service understand that impact? How does the service understand what's working and what's not working? Um, they were less clear and this was an area where it was felt more could be done to understand actually what is working, how can we make it better, what should we carry on doing, what should we stop doing. Um, so I'll show you some of these slides, um, but uh, as you've seen it's probably about 40 slides long, so something to kind of take away and have a look through um, in your own time, um, think about how you might want to use it, how it might be helpful to your service. Um, so Kind of a, there's a short introduction here, but as I mentioned, the, the idea of this deck is that it brings together some current evidence on the outcomes associated with trauma-informed practice. It talks through why and how to develop a theory of change or a logic model for implementing trauma-informed practice. And then it gestures to why and how you might develop a monitoring and evaluation framework to um, understand trauma-informed practice at your service. So there are a few slides which cover um, how what we heard anecdotally in our research is mapped uh, in um, the existing evidence base. So as Izzy talked through, um, practitioners felt the following. They recognised that children were feeling listened to and understood by the service. They were engaging more in the work they were doing. They had better relationships with um, their families. They were demonstrating less violent or aggressive behaviours and in some cases being more open to talking about their experience and trauma. Um, these were described and are described in our research as soft outcomes, um, and that's in opposition to the more traditional measures of understanding success and impact, um, in particular reoffending um, data. So there's a growing body of literature um, that supports the anecdotal accounts of practitioners that identifies positive outcomes that are associated with trauma-informed practice, and there's a link to some of that research in this deck. 
Um, but what's really key, I think, for us to collectively understand is that the progress practitioners are saying they're seeing in the young people they support um, is is all often much is often part of a much longer journey. Um, but only the the harder outcomes, such as reoffending, are captured through data recording processes. Um, but um, if they were in a position to capture data and outcomes at the interim stages of the journey or the missing middle, that would help to build an understanding of that child's progress, what's working at different stages, how is trauma-informed practice making an impact? Um, that's what the visual on this slide um, aims to demonstrate. So you can see a child or young person might tell their caseworker more about their interests. That's not information that's routinely captured. Child or young person, is actively participating more in an activity at YJS or discloses an incident in which they felt unsafe um, and carried a weapon is not information that would be routinely recorded. Um, information on education or reoffending would be. Um, and while we're not suggesting that um, there's an additional ask to all services to start collecting tons more of data, it's about thinking about how you might uh, make use of the information that practitioners already hold and already understand and feeding that into um, kind of a better understanding of children's journeys and the different stages at which trauma-informed practice impacts and can affect them. And the importance of doing this um, is to help youth justice services to understand what's working, so to better target and implement interventions to drive service improvement. Um, so it'd be helpful to manage risks and uncertainties related to intervention and its implementation also to improve existing interventions by enabling evidence-based decision-making, and as mentioned, to get a greater understanding of what works and importantly, in what context and for who. Um, so to help support um, future development of interventions and delivery and in shaping policy as well. Um, very aware that there are barriers to capturing these softer outcomes. Um, so trauma-informed practice can take many forms. It's not a universal approach um, and it's understood and implemented differently by different agencies, which can make it hard to measure in some cases. Also, as I kind of referenced there, there's potentially a difficulty in resourcing. Um, effective measurement and additional key performance indicators can take time and cost to implement. Um, very clear that um, services feel kind of under-resourced to do so um, maybe currently, and it's about shifting um, the way in which you understand this data, make sense and use the data that you already routinely collect. Um, focus on risk-based outcomes as well. So political community pressures on agencies to prioritize reducing offending and risk reduction um, and demonstrating outcomes through trauma and perform practice might take time or link less explicitly to risk reduction. And that's where the value of the theory of change in linking those assumptions um, is really key. Also recognize there is um, an immature body of research. So at the moment, evidence on those outcome measures um, isn't huge. It's an area which does need further focus and research, something we would really encourage. Then finally, that systems, um, some systems aren't kind of set up yet to capture that data. Um, so recording systems, system infrastructure um, need to be set up in a way that makes that data capture um, easy, business as usual, um, so it doesn't detract um, uh, from resources. So the first step to overcoming some of these barriers in many cases is identifying the outcomes that you'd like to see and setting out how you'll measure success against these. And that's where a theory of change um, can be really helpful. Um, so I'm sure many of you are familiar with theory of change or a logic model, but essentially um, it's a model which helps you connect the activities or the interventions that you're doing to the outcomes that you want to see. And it does that by mapping backwards the short um, and long-term outcomes that you associate with success for each activity. Um, so it helps make sense of some of those assumptions. Um, in the deck, um, and uh, yeah, as said, I'd encourage you to have a flick through in your own time. There's a step-by-step -step and a worked example of how to create a theory of change um, with some examples um, of, of existing ones in this space, which might be helpful for you to have a look at. Um, but essentially it takes you through the input, the short-term outcomes, the long-term outcomes, and the desired end goal in each case, giving examples of different things you may consider as inputs. So for example, 
An input might be training offered to practitioners, support offered to practitioners to identify the symptoms of vicarious trauma. It might be a trauma-informed intervention delivered to children and young people. So that's this is your input. You then look to identify the short-term outcomes of those inputs. So these are the rapid consequences of an input. So the impact of that training on practitioners um, or the impact of a shift in the use of a particular document or guidance. And these outcomes should be measurable and attached to indicators, which are how you identify if you've achieved them or not. So short-term outcomes here might be confidence of practitioners to deliver a certain activity or skill that might be through staff questionnaire or in supervision sessions, satisfaction of children, young people engaging with the output. Again, similarly, that could be through feedback mechanisms from children who are supported at service. So they sit next in the theory of change. You then consider your long-term outcomes uh, that you observe from the input. So these are the outcomes that you should be able to observe generally between six or six months to several years after an input. So longer term, but depending on the scope of the project, of course, or the intervention. And these often encompass um, wider or whole system change or cultural shifts. Um, and some examples here might be difference in attitudes or experiences of staff. Um, improved outcomes for children and young people on the caseload, or you might be looking there at the proportion of young people completing certain activities or programs. Um, in the worked example, um, here we've got well-being of staff improves, staff are knowledgeable and skilled, supported to deliver high quality trauma-informed care, reduction in trauma symptoms of children and young people on the caseload. And then finally, it links to your desired end goal for the input. Um, and this is what all the short and the long term outcomes are leading you towards. Um, it's how you connect everything together in the, the logic chain. And your desired end goal should be aligned to the reasons that you've decided to implement the trauma informed practice in the first place. Um, it would generally be a kind of a change to the service or agency's way of working and aspire change um, or the experience or the outcomes of the children or young people that you work with. So here in the work example, uh, one of the divide end goals might be that children or young people don't reoffend. So following this in the toolkit, which I won't take you through now because um, we will run out of time, um, but there's more information on how to create a monitoring and evaluation framework, which is linked to your theory of change and can support you to capture some of the data uh, and check whether those outcomes are being met. Um, Further on the page, as mentioned, we've got different videos from our experts. We have links to um, information where there's further guidance you can click on um, for, for support, for information, for research, um, and for more detail on some of the case studies. Um, have a case study here from the Champions Programme in Lancashire, which is a preventative programme funded by Lancashire VRU something to read about, um, again, with links and references for further reading. Um, here we have a video from Mifta uh, Chowdhury, who's the founder and CEO of You Think, who we've referenced a few times. So in the video, Mifta introduces a lived experience charity um, that's partnered with Southwark um, and talks about the impact of the work that they do. Um, definitely do give that a watch. There's a case study of You Think here below as well for more information. We have Michael again, he's talking about child first in more depth and building pro-social identity and how that is very much aligned to trauma-informed work um, and child first. And then in our final section on continuous learning and reflective practice, um, we think about the different questions that as a service, um, as a partnership or group, you might ask yourself to understand where you are on that journey of trauma-informed, to take a look at um, the the work, the activities, the approach that you're taking, think about how you might strengthen that and kind of drive for continuous improvement as well. Um, and there's some resources there to support you with that work. Um, a reference to the beginning, a really important part of that was getting feedback on the research. And um, we were really happy to have a, um, a, a really interesting, helpful conversation with the Race Equality Foundation about some of the research that they um, have begun which looks at the impact of racial and intergenerational trauma on young people and how services can respond and support young people with that. Um, there's a video um, here from Mamina Iqbal, who is a policy and practice research assistant at the Race Equality Foundation, um, who discusses that intersection between racism and trauma, how it can affect young people. Um, I'm going to 
pause here um, because I want to encourage everyone to have a look at their research, which is fantastic and is linked from our page. I'm aware we only have 20 minutes left. So I'm going to hand over to John to take us through the Q&A. Um, if you haven't already popped a question into the Q&A um, and you would like to, please do do that now. Um, and then John will take us through some of them. If we have any time at the end, we can jump back to the toolkit and maybe watch another video too. Um, oh, over to you, John. <clears throat> well, I think um, you will undoubtedly join me in uh, giving a verbal uh, clap. If we're in a room, we'd obviously all be clapping. And I think uh, you'll all agree with me that that was an incredibly dense, deep uh, a, a presentation that um, we've just been able to um, be a part of and you will undoubtedly have an awful lot of homework if you hadn't already um, been able to go onto the toolkit and have read the report before now as well so there's an awful lot there and that was just a whistle stop tour but incredibly um, powerful use of, of uh, an hour um, of your time I'm sure really excited and i hope that you can all see uh where you're all from i can never quite remember with the webinar function but i, I was just jotting down uh where we're all at I haven't had a chance to map it out but there is a brilliant coverage across uh, the uk so it's really great to see uh, all of you uh, represented here and it's great to see the questions starting to come in so as jess has already said and uh while she uh, gets a well-deserved glass of water um do keep uh bringing putting those questions in try and put them in the q a but we'll capture them whether they come into the chat function or the q a function um here in the team anyway but um we'll jump straight into some of those questions so um firstly i know some sometimes it automatically puts you in as anonymous or your name but um first question up from anonymous attendee uh, you can always um pop your name into the chat if you'd like um uh, a direct response to yourself but um thank you for the first question uh, it's asking uh the yjb data captures reoffending rates is it worthwhile capturing enforcement or breach rates to consider the impact of trauma informed practice for example a reduction in the number of court breaches or post court orders Uh, yeah, definitely. So uh, very good question. And uh, I think you'll find it probably comes up in our uh, monitoring framework guidance, uh, that it should definitely be considered as a KPI, uh, without a doubt. It's definitely uh, a powerful kind of source of information. And it's also been identified in quite a lot of the current literature around trauma-informed practice as somewhere that trauma-informed practice very likely does have an impact on. Um, but again, as we've kind of touched on, it crucially can't be the whole picture. We can see those things as quite far into a, a child or young person's journey. Um, so it's important to take a few steps back as well and start thinking about those, as we've spoken about a couple of times, those softer outcomes um, and how we can kind of capture little moments on the way towards kind of court breaches. Brilliant. Thank you, Z. Um, so we'll uh, jump across to the next question, uh, which I think is the one from uh, the chat from Mary. Uh, Mary Dover, thank you very much from Lewisham. Um, so a uh, question from Mary here is, did you explore or did anything emerge in the research regarding the effects of institutional racism and discrimination and unconscious bias, um, poverty and par parental mental health or me uh, parental illness? especially useful given the disproportionality and record levels of school exclusion. Thank you for a great question, Mary. Yeah, it's a fantastic question. Thank you, Mary. Um, so in a sense, not in the initial research because we didn't uh, collect demographic information um, on the young people who we spoke to. So in our field work, um, we didn't go into depth um, about the backgrounds of the young people who were um, getting support from youth justice services. It wasn't the key research question for us. Um, and we were keen to minimize the risk of re-traumatization re by asking um, questions about background. Um, however, 
do recognize um, that there is a gap in the research in that space. And this is supplemented um, with the interview with Mamina um, in the toolkit, which I really do encourage everyone to, to watch. We were very aware it was a gap that we wanted to um, explore um, in terms of how trauma-informed works differently for different children and to understand more about what that does and should look like. Um, especially for children who have been victims of institutional racism, discrimination, and unconscious bias. Thank you, Mary. Thanks, Jess. A question from uh, Niall. Uh, Niall and his dogs, I think, from uh, having looked at the comments earlier. Hi, Niall, and uh, hi to your dogs. Um, uh, we can't hear them, don't worry. Um, question is, we are always praised for our trauma-informed work in inspections and audits but the current inspection framework places very little weight on it. Inspection and audit frameworks are highly weighted towards risk assessments and planning for those risks. And this is often counterproductive to trauma-informed work and can exacerbate ordinary traumatized children. Are there any recommendations for the Youth Justice Board and the HMIP uh, inspectors to change those frameworks to give more value to the trauma-informed work we do? Yes, yeah. Over to Sophie. Great. Thank you. It's a really interesting question. Um, yeah, I think, of course, it's really important to understand and plan for risk. But what I think we heard from practitioners and what you seem to be getting to is that the two are not necessarily mutually exclusive and that taking a trauma informed approach can help children and young people progress in their journey towards resistance, um, towards less offending, which in turn obviously minimizes risk to themselves and to the rest of the community. Um, and so that's why we think it's really important that we collectively build the evidence base for uh, trauma-informed approaches via the sort of like softer outcomes that Jess and Izzy have talked about so that we can evidence that progress um, and have kind of more evidence towards the YJB that these outcomes should be measured and not just kind of outcomes such as uh, risk and reoffending, which are a bit more binary. Thanks, Thanks, Sophie. Sophie. Um, um, next question. Next question. Um, another one from another anonymous attendee, but do feel free to uh, pop your name into the chat uh, so we can direct that question to you. Um, it asks, do you know if clinical supervision was offered to the Youth Justice uh, Service staff in your research, or was it just one-to-one -one supervision with their manager? As a service, we've been trying to fight for funding for clinical supervision, given the rise in complex cases. Um, great question, and uh, and you've touched on vicarious trauma uh, throughout the work. So yeah, uh, who'd like to answer that one? Yeah, I'm happy to. Um, thank you for the question. It's a really good one. And yes, clinical supervision was offered to some of the staff that we spoke to in our research. Uh, practitioners from Southwark in particular were really frequently praising the regular and embedded one-to-one -one and group supervisions that they were having with clinical supervisors. Um, these were seen as really helpful to kind of embed trauma-informed practice further in the service by building their knowledge of trauma and allowing crucially kind of those spaces for critical reflection around a caseworker's choices with a child or young person they're working with. So for example, giving caseworkers the, the time and space to come to a, a clinical supervisor saying, I approached this in this way in this session. I don't know if that was the right way. I don't know if that was fully considerate of their of their trauma. And they can kind of lean on that clinical supervisor um, to kind of guide them there. Uh, so they're a bit like in-house experts we uh, we found in this, in this model. Um, and also kind of crucially, we found that clinical psychologists were uh, very useful with helping to manage the symptoms of vicarious trauma within the service. So again, allowing uh, case holders to have spaces to, I guess, decompress um, and think quite critically about uh, a child or young person's case. So yeah, uh, clinical supervision was definitely, definitely seen as an asset. Um, and I think this comes through quite strongly in our report, especially, as you said, given the, the rise in complex cases. So I'm sorry that you're struggling to fight for funding for it. I think continue the fight, um, uh, obviously easier said than done, but it was definitely an asset. Thanks, Izzy. Um, next question in from Heidi. There we go. Um, so how do you see the relationship between trauma-informed practice and restorative justice? Who would like to take that one? I can take this one. Yes, so um, we had some early conversations where this did um, 
come up and we spoke to um, a lead at restorative justice um, at one of the services um, we initially engaged with, which was a really valuable conversation. Um, I'm very aware that there is discussion around whether trauma-informed practice um, is compatible with a restorative um, justice approach, um, thinking in particular about whether uh, restorative justice and engagement with victims um, is always trauma-informed for the young person who um, has offended um, and, and how those two align. So while we didn't go on to specifically consider this relationship um, in the, the research, the relationships between trauma-informed and other approaches, um, including restorative justice, but also systemic practice um, and child first was something that we explored more generally in the report. And we heard a lot um, of people discuss um, the value of having clarity on the extent to which these approaches are aligned um, and not duplicative. Um, we think it's something that re does require further research where further research would be valuable, um, but um, it does seem like restorative justice is compatible with the principles, especially where there is choice involved um, being key. Um, one of the recommendations from our research is that the YJB should take the lead in producing guidance on how different approaches sit together um, to provide that clarity for services. Um, but that's the sort of thing that we're really keen to hear more about from you and others with frontline experience um, as we're keen to, to continue um, unpicking practice and, and understanding what that means for those um, working on the front line. Thank you so much, Jess. Uh, so the next question uh, we've got here is, um, uh, again, an anonymous attendee but uh, that we can see, but do again, uh, like Jennifer, let us know um, uh, if it's your question that we can direct it to you. Uh, but the question is, what are your suggestions about engaging police, CPS, courts to ad adopt the trauma-informed approach if they see it as a soft touch? Sorry. Uh, yeah, that's a really good question. Thank you. Um, that's not something that we specifically explored in this research. So we've heard about it secondhand um, via the youth justice practitioners that we spoke to. Um, so actually, I think it would warrant further research for us to go into the specific barriers. Um, but just from kind of anecdotal evidence and what we know so far, we know that some of the barriers are kind of structural, that there's lack of resources to be able to embed trauma-informed practices in other areas. Um, but some of the other barriers are also cultural, where it seems like there's a less, there's been less progress and understanding of these approaches than there has been in the youth justice system. Um, and here, I think that there's probably some learnings that we could have from the developed nations in Scotland and Wales, who seem to have made quite a lot of progress embedding trauma-informed practices across all agencies that deal with children um, and not diffuse justice. So I think that's a good area for, for us for future research. Um, and also if you've got any uh, learnings on that, any kind of evidence that you'd like to share, please do, because we're always looking for ways in which we can kind of further uh, improve the, the toolkit. So we'd be really keen to hear from you about it. Thanks, Thank you, Sophie. Sophie. Um, Next question I've got here is um, from another anonymous, uh, but do again, feel free to pop your name in the chat. In Wales, uh, did you see any differences given that social care and health is devolved in Wales to the Welsh Government and that legislative duties differ with a focus within social care and health settings to focus on a what matters discussion, child first and trauma informed approaches to all service areas. Uh, Great question to follow up on your last answer, Sophie. Um, yeah, it is a brilliant question, thinking about um, the importance of um, multi-agency um, in terms of response. So to clarify, we didn't do our field work um, in Wales, unfortunately. The services that we um, engaged in the main body of the work were Lancashire and Southwark. So we did consult um, manager and head of service for Comtaf, which was incredibly valuable in bringing some of that Welsh context in. Um, but we didn't do in-depth field work. Um, so we didn't do interviews um, or data analysis of a Welsh service. So on that basis, it's difficult to pull out any differences or speak conclusively on that. 
um, except to say that Comtaf in particular were very advanced in their journey of working with government to create a Wales-wide approach. Um, and I know that they have shared um, a lot of their um, guidance and supporting documents um, on the YJB Hub. So do pursue that and take a look um, if you're interested. But a very interesting question and absolutely something to think about in the future as well, an area to explore. Brilliant. Thanks, Jess. Uh, questions are coming in thick and fast. This is great. Do do um, We'll see how many we can squeeze in for the uh, last, uh, I think, eight minutes. Uh, we've got Lindsay Dodd has asked, um, we're really keen to do more in respect of in, uh, embedding trauma-informed practice, but this is a challenge with increasingly less resources and other agencies also balancing their own budgets. Is there any financial commitment from governing bodies to support so to supporting services to implement this? I'd like to answer that. Yeah, sure. Um, yeah, this is definitely something we recognise and something that kind of practitioners brought up, I think particularly with the fact that taking a trauma-informed approach can mean, as Izzy went through, taking kind of longer time to form a relationship with a child, which sometimes can be at odds with um, fewer resources and the need to kind of go quicker and having uh, larger caseworks. Um, so unfortunately, we're not kind of we're not responsible for the uh, financial commitments, uh, but with kind of a new government uh, in place and the fact that, you know, as there's more and more evidence building in this particular sphere, I think that's what can hopefully can uh, add to the pressure to increase resources for financial for youth justice services to enable services to uh, finance these kinds of approaches. Brilliant. Brilliant. Thanks, Sophie. Um, jumping across to uh, Paul Stride's question in the chat. Um, do you have any views on whether trauma-informed is the correct term for work that appears multifaceted and not necessarily linked to trauma? Great question to put it out there. Uh, who'd like to answer that? I can take this one. Um, I think it's a fantastic question. Um, and it links as well to uh, some of the findings Izzy was talking through about um, a, a slight anxiety from some practitioners on the use of the word trauma, um, understanding um, kind of what that what that meant, where it was appropriate and concern about risking re-traumatizing children as well, given that the landscape and the evidence is so fast paced, um, understanding where we sit in that, um, what the best approach is at the best time. Um, I think your point also is really linked uh, Paul, to that point around the alignment with other frameworks. So if we're talking about child first, if we're talking about systemic, systemic practice and trauma informed in the same breath, and actually there are lots of parallels between these approaches, how helpful is it to hold on to that language of trauma informed practice? Um, where does it add value or where does it risk confusion? I don't think that's something that um, kind of our team have, have the answer to in particular, but it's absolutely an important question to keep asking um, to keep, um, yeah, to keep asking, to keep pushing back and finding a language that works across services, that is shared across services um, and makes sense across services. Thanks, Jess. And again, Paul, thanks for that great question. I mean, language certainly is is very live, isn't it? And I can see how uh, we can have this same discussion in the same way as uh, I had lots of discussions around public health approaches to tackling violence and, you know, are these buzzwords or, or uh, well, and certainly this is where I feel Crest's uh, research and this toolkit really help us work on the language and what do we really mean? So that's uh, a great question. Uh, we're going to go over to Kate Denny's question. Uh, um, did you cover uh, neurodiversity in your research? I find that this can be forgotten in a trauma informed service, let alone the trauma faced by being neurodivergent in the first place. Who'd like to answer that? Happy to. Thanks, Izzy. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, it's a really it's a really good question. I think we we completely agree that uh, it is something that's often forgotten in research. We've definitely seen that in the kind of research that we've reviewed. Um, but no, unfortunately, again, we might have engaged with neurodiverse children and young people in our interviews, but we didn't collect this depth of demographic data. Um, first of all, kind of because our sample size wasn't big enough for us to be able to make conclusions on the difference of how different groups of children and young people were experiencing kind of trauma informed support. Um, but this is absolutely an area kind of ripe for further research. 
Um, so yeah, we would be incredibly eager to read anything that anyone else produces on it, but no, unfortunately we weren't able to look specifically at this in ours. Thanks, Izzy. Um, we've got a few more minutes, so we've got three questions so far. Do feel free to keep throwing them in and we'll see how quickly we can answer them. Uh, but it's great to see them coming. So Karen McCarthy over in the chat has asked, uh, has this approach improved the impact and effectiveness of other programs, for example, AIMS? If you'd like to answer that. Um, it will be a short answer, unfortunately, um, Karen. Another great question. We didn't look specifically at this, sorry. So we, we wouldn't be able to answer that in a particularly robust way. But absolutely, it's something worth thinking about for future research um, and keeping in mind if you do want to kind of get in touch with us to talk in more depth about um, what that could look like um, or any thoughts you have on this, please do. Thanks, Jess. Um, over to Georgia Watkinson. Uh, I think you might have the last question of the day, actually. I uh, mistook a, a comment from uh, Jennifer. Thank you very much as a question. Um, so Georgia, over to you. Um, and anyone else can come in and uh, pip Georgia and get the last question of the day if they really want to. Um, did you find any specific barriers to involving children in the interviews? And would you approach them differently uh, if doing this research again? Yep, sure. Um, but just definitely do jump in afterwards. So um, I don't think we did experience any any specific barriers. Um, I think that was in a large part to do with the fact that we had some really fantastic gatekeepers at each service um, that we kind of been engaging with for for quite a while, like since the project's inception. Um, so these gatekeepers were able to facilitate the coordination of our interviews, give us the information that we needed about the children and young people beforehand, ensure that a trusted adult was going to be present and help set up our introductory calls. Um, so we really couldn't have done it without without their support. Um, I think looking towards the future, the more kind of co-production work we'd be able to do with children and young people, the better. Um, we would have definitely liked to have brought children and young people in to consult on our approach uh, at an even earlier stage, uh, kind of in the, the research conception and design. Um, and I think ultimately for me, uh, every single one of those interviews that I was in was absolutely phenomenal. These children and young people were able to express themselves in a way that I couldn't have dreamt of doing today, let alone at the age of 14. Um, they were fantastic. So I think the insights that we got were so rich and so so powerful, so pertinent that in general, the the more that we could do, the better. So uh, if I could do it again, I would ideally love to do as many children, young people interviews as humanly possible. So that again, we can try to tease out those differences to see if children who've been impacted by something like institutional racism uh, are experiencing support differently than, than other children, whether neurodiverse children are experiencing it differently. Um, so yeah, that that's aspiration, I guess. Jess, anything to add? I don't think anything to add that's uh, well described, Izzy. Um, I think that brings us to the end of the session. It, it does indeed, indeed. incredibly timely. timely. So, so thank, thank you all for your questions. And yeah, I'll hand back to Jess. Thanks, John. Um, yes, so that wraps up today's webinar. Thank you um, so much for joining us, for your contributions and for sharing your insight as well. We've really enjoyed reading your comments, um, your questions. And thank you again to everyone who contributed to the toolkit and to the research. Um, the expert advisory groups and anyone who has engaged with the research report. Um, if you haven't already, it is available to read on our website. The toolkit is there too. Um, if you would like to get in touch with us um, about any aspect of the research or the toolkit, um, please do reach out to Sophie, who is um, the head of our think tank, Crest Insights. Um, she'll be very happy to uh, receive your email, set up a call. Um, yeah, so thank you and take care.